Amen. All right, we want to jump into our series uh, called Being Church. It started a few weeks ago. Jimmy did a great job with the family business message. Rick Olden last week was here. He's great. He, he teaches on church all the time, but... He showed up and taught about something else. <laughs> but it was a good message about being strong and, and overcoming personal battles. And so it applies because in order to be a strong church, we need to be strong individuals. Um, and we're going to continue in this theme of the what and the why of church. And particularly, I'm speaking uh, today about um, what those in the business call a philosophy of ministry. In other words, how... Uh, we as a church look at ministry <clears throat> and the things that we emphasize or highlight that kind of are the guiding principles of how we do what we do and why we do what we do. Oh, by the way, I don't have a slideshow, which I normally do, <clears throat> um, and I uh, require all of our teachers to do. So bad, bad on me. It's the exception. I found this new app. It's called the Paper App. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned this at first service. I'm like, why don't people laugh at my joke? And they said, well, they're all dad jokes. <laughs> well, it's Father's Day. It's Father's Day. So, <clears throat> all right. Stay on track, Cameron. So we are talking about being church, the what and why we do, and the philosophy of ministry. So I'm just going to talk about some key things that shape this church, New Day Community Church, and of course they have influence on all the churches, and probably all churches would say, yeah, we agree to these things, but we really kind of, these are our, this is a template that we filter everything through. And the first one is uh, the place of church and the plan of God, all right? And Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, the place of church and the plan of God. Even, even had a lot of P's in that. What do you call that? Alliteration. Alliteration. <laughs> That's part of our priorities as a church. Are you ready? <laughs> Ephesians 3, if you have a Bible, turn to it. Pull it up on your U version. 3a, I'll read it and then we'll talk about it. To me, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. I love how this, uh, and many of the primary uh, theological emphasis of the Bible are rooted in creation, that God created heavens and the earth for a purpose, and this purpose is intertwined. It goes all the way back to creation, and that God created all things through this person called Jesus Christ, the one we worship. Verse 10, to the intent. In other words, God's creation had a purpose to the intent that now. When? Now. All right. Is it still now? Yes. Was it now when he wrote it? Yes. All right. That means present tense. This doesn't change. This is a, a perpetual purpose of God that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. What's the next three words? By the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's instrument to make known his wisdom is the church. The church is not plan B, and there is no plan B. It was a purpose, according to Scripture, from the creation. Now, there are some theologies out there that teach that the church is plan B. And then there's a step C that comes later. And I would say this verse challenges that, okay? Uh, and that it was always the intent of God to have a people of all races, all ethnicities, all language come together in one spiritual family, which we call the church, that will eternally celebrate and worship God and be in relationship with him, all right? The message was first delivered to the Jews and the Hebrews and the covenant 
uh, of Moses and the law, but it was intended to be spread to the ends of the earth. And that's, that's a whole other message I can talk about. What I want to emphasize here is that God's wisdom, all right, is God a is, Do you think God has wisdom? Yeah. All right, I mean, like compared to you or I, is he just a, <laughs> is he just a little smarter? <laughs> like compared to me, he's really smarter. Compared to Nathan, he's like, a little, he's still even a little smarter than that. <laughs> all right. No, all right. Like, what did God get on his SAT? <laughs> oh, is God wise? Yeah. He's a wise guy. Ha, 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 ha. Dad joke. <clears throat> All right. But listen, it says here that God chose the church to be the, the manifestation of his wisdom. And I'm like, wait a minute here. Really? Okay, so when you think about church... Do you think, like, man, the church has just got it down? Not yet. An honest answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. I mean, like, we're pretty good. But, like, I, could, I didn't even have the mic on, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Half the time the clicker doesn't work, right? Wisdom and technology. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is the church one harmonious spiritual family that always just loves one another? No. Uh, no. <laughs> Do you know that there's over 300 separate denominations just within the Baptist church in North America? Whoa. Whoa. Just the Baptists, there are over 300 divisions. <laughs> That's why we're not Baptists. <laughs> Are we unified? So this is my response. I'm like, really, God? We're supposed to display your wisdom? This ragtag bunch of people that can't hardly get along for five minutes? And I think the resounding answer is, yeah. That to the principalities and powers, who, who's that? Well, that means two things, refers to two things. Those are demonic and angelic beings that have authority in creation and over people, all right? And we can go into the different levels of that, but it's throughout Scripture. There are demonic entities that have influence. <clears throat> and there are angelic ent entities that are in alignment with God's kingdom. And God's showing all of the heavenly hosts just how bright he is, <laughs> okay? But it also applies to, principalities and powers can also apply to uh, natural government and authorities, Kings and princes and our presidents and nations. <clears throat> and, and, the, and the application of this verse is it's gonna, it, God's going to use the church to display his wisdom to both the spiritual and the natural ruling principalities and powers. He's going to do this. All right. It's not only he is going to do it. Let me tell you, he is already doing it. Do you realize that the church is the only institution that for now 2,000 years has survived and prospered regardless of what the world has thrown and the devil has thrown at it? Do you realize that? Do you realize that the Soviet Union declared itself an, an atheistic nation and set its course to destroy the church from the Soviet Union? Guess what? They never succeeded. But the Soviet Union is long gone. Boom. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. No matter what they did, they couldn't keep these people from praying. In fact, the harder they cracked down, the more uh, zealous the Christians began. Same thing in China. All right. I, I knew someone that was in, uh, was it Iraq or Iran? I can't remember. <clears throat> uh, and uh, they had heard about, the, the government had heard about the underground church. So this is what they were doing. They were going to villages where there was an underground church with bulldozers and, and cranes, and they were digging, looking for the underground church. <laughs> Seriously. Like, I heard this from a guy who lived in that country, and he came out. He's like, it was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> they would come up with these cranes, and they kept digging in holes, looking for the underground church, thinking that there was a church building underground. All right. Where is the fastest growing church in the world right now? China. 
<laughs> a nation that declared war against the church. It's an atheistic nation, but you know what? They're like, oh, we can't stop it. All right? And so the, the truth is that God's wisdom is prevailing. And uh, it, this is his purpose. It says to, uh, that uh, <clears throat> according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus. In other words, what Jesus accomplished, it, it, according to that, it is being implemented or distributed through this entity called the church, of which we are a branch office, okay? And so this is really important. This means church is important. It's super important to God. And if you want your life, it's great to have a purpose for life. And I hope that you all have a personal purpose. Maybe it's succeeding in business. Maybe it's being a great parent, a great person. Maybe it's being uh, whatever. But if your purpose aligns to God's purpose then it's going to have an eternal impact. Now, it doesn't mean that you need to be in ministry, paid ministry, to be uh, in alignment to the, God's purpose. But it does mean that whatever your purpose is should be supportive of the church. And so if, because the church is God's purpose to uh, display his wisdom. And so if you're in business, that your work and your workplace can be a place where you can influence others with the message of the gospel. All right. And you can invite them and you can bring people that are outside of the church. You can connect with them where they are and introduce them to this wonderful thing called the family of God, the church of God. And so uh, having purpose uh, obviously brings meaning to life. Don't live a life without purpose. And I invite you and God invites you personally to come into his purpose, which is the church. And as we function together as a spiritual family, even with all of our faults and weaknesses, we display God's wisdom. Does that sound good? Yeah. So the application is value the church and invest yourself in the church and align your personal purpose with God's great eternal purpose and you'll get uh, blessed because of it. When I became pastor a number of years ago, back around uh, 1999, 2000 was the transition. Before that, I was the associate pastor. There was a few things that Kathy and I, my wife, <clears throat> really wanted to make uh, priorities in our ministry. And so we're, we're going to touch on those things. The first one is that church is really important. It's the purpose of God. Ne next thing that we're going to talk about is that church should look like Jesus' ministry. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good idea. I was just thinking, like, if the bet, more we can look like Jesus, I mean, Jesus' ministry is pretty important, right? We want to model ourselves after that. There's one verse in particularly that I'm going to uh, use to, to describe this, and if you want to turn to it and read along, it's in Luke chapter 6, verse 12 through 17. Luke 6, 12 through 17. It's a snippet from uh, the life of Jesus, a little story from which we're going to extract some truths about how Jesus did ministry, all right? And so one day, soon afterward, Jesus went up on the mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. Wow. Prayer was important to Jesus. We value prayer. We try to integrate prayer into all we do. And uh, like that K-Hop, six hours, 6 p.m. to midnight. So let me tell you, if you want to learn how to pray uh, for 30 minutes, uh, or an hour, pray for six hours, and after that, praying for 20 or 30 minutes is like hard, because it's hard to pray that short, all right? And so six, uh, you don't have to come for the whole six hours, though. Come for an hour. Come for 30 minutes. It's like open house prayer. Thank you. <laughs> this is open house season, right? How many have gone to an open house in the last couple of weeks? Well, we've got a lot of them this year. So drop in, pray to God. At daybreak, verse 13, he called together all of his disciples, called together all of his disciples, and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names. Simon, uh, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, another James, uh, Simon, who's called a zealot, Judas, the son of James, and the other Judas, who betrayed him. <clears throat> when they came down from the mountain, so there, there was a group of disciples, he chose 12 out of them, and then they came down from the, the, mount, the mountain, and the disciples stood with Jesus on a large level area, surrounded by many of his followers, so there's a bigger group, and by the crowds. Uh, and there were people from all over Judea and Ju uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and the whole region. And so what we, what we see in this verse is that there's three groups of people. There's the, the core, 
which uh, Jesus chose out of the larger group, which is what we'll call the congregation. So this group of disciples, it's important as you read the New Testament, the word disciple is used in different ways. Sometimes it refers to the twelve. But most often, it refers to a bigger group of people that uh, counted to hundreds, possibly anywhere from two to three hundred to eight or nine hundred. And so it was just this big group of uh, uh, followers. At one point, he chose 70 and sent out 70 to go from village to village. Where did he choose those from? From this uh, group or this congregation of disciples. And these were people that basically bought in. They were members. They showed wherever Jesus was teaching, they were there. They loved his teaching. Maybe they had been healed, and so they came at every meeting because this is exciting. They believed what Jesus has taught. They saw Jesus as their rabbi. Uh, the core were the 12 selected out of the bigger group to become leaders. So just think for a minute. <clears throat> you go to bed. You're, getting, you're, you're with this big group of people that's been listening to Jesus, and it's getting nighttime, and you're getting, this is where we're going to sleep. You, know? you ever been camping? Uh, so they're, they're getting their place ready to sleep. And Jesus said, I'm going to go pray. Like, wow, Jesus is going to pray again. So he walks up. You think he'll be back in an hour or two. And you, you go to sleep. And he's like, wow, Jesus is not back yet. I hope he's okay. And then you wake up in the morning and Jesus isn't there. Oh, James, you seen Jesus? No. Huh. Was, uh, Judas, no. And then you hear him walking down the mountain. And you realize, dang, he's been praying all night. Huh? Wow. And then he says something. Now, what do you think it would have been like if he said your name? Wow. Bill. Come here. All right? Paul. Come here. Jamie. Come here. James. Lewis. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> He's my kid. I can do that with him. <laughs> How would you have felt if you were one of those? Honest answer. Come on. What comes to your mind? Honored. Wow. Yeah, this is what I, I was scared to death. <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. Wow. What does this mean? Well, actually, it meant a lot because um, in that culture, that's what rabbis would do. They'd walk and they would call someone to follow them. And it was the greatest honor uh, every kid was, every parent hoped their kid, child, their, uh, their son would be called by a rabbi to be discipled, okay? Because that, in their culture, in the Hebrew culture, that was the most honorable job, all right? Uh, and they'd be respected by everything. So it was a huge honor. But these guys were all past the age that normally would have been called by a rabbi. They were young men. They were working, and they had already gone through that, and they, were, they weren't going to make it. They missed the cut, but Jesus called them anyway. So it was a great honor. <clears throat> and he spent more time with them. He talked, taught them on a deeper level. And he gave them responsibilities. Right? And so that core, the 12, represents in a church setting our leadership. So the people whose pictures are out on the wall in the foyer, those are our core. All right? Anybody with a leadership, people on the teaching team, these are our core. And so we invest more time in them because they're, 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 they're equipping uh, the congregation. The congregation would be all of his disciples or many of his followers, that bigger group of hundreds. And, uh, and if you're a member here, you would fit into that. And we call that the congregation. You know, thankfully, you show up every Sunday. <laughs> Nobody laughs. <laughs> Most Sundays. How many here are every Sunday? I'm not here every Sunday. <laughs> Most Sundays. But we can count on you. You're part of the team. All right? And so um, you're, you're the congregation. And so can you imagine what it was like for, the, for that, that, that first congregation? Can you imagine sitting on uh, the mount, hearing Jesus teach the Sermon on the Mount in his own voice? Huh? Come on. What do you think? That's pretty cool. Uh, how about being there uh, because you're just, you're just one of his followers and you happen to be with him when he's walking through this village. And they, we were just going to the next meeting place, right? And a funeral happens by. 
And nobody asked him, but Jesus said, man, I don't like this. That kid's dead, and the mom's sad. And Jesus walked up and did what was against the law. He touched the dead body, and the kid sat up. Come on, would you have liked to have been there? That's the privilege of being a Christ follower. All right, you're part of it. And, and then you're trained. And you see, you know, can you imagine being there when you see Jesus, there's no food, and he, and he talks with the 12, and the 12 go have everybody sit down, and all of a sudden they take this little basket of a few fish and a few loaves of bread and feed 5,000, and you're eating it, and there's a basket left over. That's great, all right? That's what it means to be a Christ follower, to be part of the church, and so that's the congregation. And then there's the crowd. And these are people that just happened. Maybe you're part of the crowd. Maybe you just stopped in because you, you, you're checking out church or, or you're checking out Christianity. Maybe you're not a Christian, um, uh, but you're here because someone invited you and said, uh, if you come, I'll take you out to lunch afterwards. You know, uh, <clears throat> um, and we interact with the crowds every day when we're in our workplaces. All right? These are people who don't know. And it's our job to tell the story that we our story to them of how we have encountered Jesus and how he's changed our life. And so church should be a place. Jesus ministered to the core. Jesus ministered to the congregation. And Jesus ministered to the crowd. You know that almost all of Jesus' miracles happened in the crowd. There's only a couple of miracles that happened in a private place. Almost all of it. What does that say? I believe that we're supposed to be displaying the miraculous power of God when we're out on the streets. All right. And church time, uh, people are like, why don't we see many miracles in church? Because we're all saved. You know, we're, we're to be trained to go out and heal the sick. All right. He would send his disciples out. All right. To heal the sick. Uh, Jesus loves Kalamazoo. All right. Hallelujah. And so we, those are uh, scheduled opportunities, but we're called to be the church all year round. <clears throat> and so um, we want this church, New Day, to be uh, raising up core, uh, blessing the congregation in every service. We want everybody to, be, to receive something. If this is your first time here, we want to see people come and hear. And thankfully we do on a regular basis. We see people come, they get saved, they get baptized, they get plugged in, and they grow up. And so we really, really, really pray that uh, like Jesus' ministry, church is a place where wherever you're at on that journey, spiritual journey, you can come and find something. Another thing that we highly value is being family friendly, kid friendly. Uh, Matthew 19.13 <clears throat> The little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. Parents wanted their kids to be touched by Jesus. That's a good thing. But the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me and don't forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. So just like Jesus' disciples misunderstood Jesus' priority and his purpose, um, often churches and, and, and people in church, they just get tired of the kids bothering. I actually had a pastor visit this church. It was a few years ago. And we had a bunch of little kids running around and dancing, which I happen to love. All right. But this, this pastor was of a uh, pastor of the church from a different stream of churches. And we were talking afterwards and, and he actually came up to me and said, you know what? I actually, I need to talk to you about something. Can we go somewhere quiet? So this pastor took me and sat me down in my own office. <laughs> I'm serious. And he starts talking. I'm like, this guy is correcting me in my office about how to do church. He says, you need to do something about those kids. Because they're just running around. They're disrespectful. I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, inside, I was laughing out loud. All right. But I was like, well, thank you for your advice. I, mean, I happen to like kids. You know? And, you know, praise God. If you want to go to a church where the kids are forced to be quiet so that when they get old enough, they don't want to be in church anymore... Yeah. Go for it. I like this. Okay? I want, I want my kids to love being in church. And so I had a parent, uh, this is not long ago, uh, like a year or two ago, her kid was climbing on the chairs. <clears throat> and she was like, oh, she was so embarrassed. Get off the chair, get off the chair. I'm like, hey, the kid's not going to break the chair. Don't worry about it. I said, if I'm on the chair, you, that's a problem. 
<laughs> She's like, really? I'm like, listen, I want kids. And so we really tried to do everything to be family friendly. Uh, and so uh, couches in the back, or uh, you can take your kids. We do as, as best we can. And that's one of the big priorities of the 320 and beyond, raising enough money so that we can build on and reconfigure this building to be more family friendly so people can bring their kids and feel safe. Uh, it's our vision uh, to do that. My sister moved. Uh, she was very active. Her family was active in the church uh, where she was living uh, in Michigan, they moved out to Colorado this many years ago, and after about a year, she, she told me, she's like, she said, I, would, she said I, I can't go to church anymore. I'm like, what's the problem? What's, why, why is that? She said, I would do so much work to get all the kids ready and get them dressed and get them in the car and get them to the church, and then I end up sitting in some room with all my kids begging to get out of this room because there's no child care. So she lived in a rural area. I'm like, I broke my heart. She's never been back to church. And so I think of her, my sister and her kids when I think about how are we going to do church. And so <clears throat> I would ask you to apply this in your own life to ask a question. Maybe ask your spouse, ask your friends if you're uh, here together. Um, what can you do to make New Day more family friendly? And a big part of it is helping out in the children's ministry. It's the biggest need of ministry. And doing it fantastic, having fun, making it a fun time. Or it might be something else uh, to help New Day become more family friendly. It's a high priority. priority. Okay, the next one <clears throat> is uh, found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. This is Paul writing to the, pastor, uh, writing to the church in Ephesus about um, church. He says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Those are what we call the five-fold ministry, the five offices of ministry. For, but they're given, or let's just say the five job descriptions, right? Job titles. They're given for the, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying and the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All right, and so these jobs, pastor, uh, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, are like uh, job titles for people that serve the church in a greater capacity, but they serve the church to equip the church to do the work of ministry. It's not their job to do the work of ministry. And there was a shift, uh, and it often happens in churches that we think we hire people to do the work of ministry. It's the pastor's job to do that. When really the pastor's job, and anybody that works for the church, is to equip the congregation, because it's only when the congregation is equipped that we can actually do the work of ministry. Only one in a hundred Christians receive any compensation for their work whatsoever. And fewer than that are full-time employed. Okay, church doesn't work if you're counting on only those getting paid doing the work. That's not God's design. God's design is that we together learn how to do the work and are equipped and so my job as a pastor is to help equip you and equip the core leaders to help equip each and every person in the congregation to do the ministry. Real ministry happens when every church member finds that they can um, pray for the sick. All right? You know, you don't need the pastor to come. You find out somebody's in the hospital, go visit them. Pray for them. Believe, you know. Uh, if you want to be trained on how to do that, we can do that. I do that. I take people to ho on hospital visits. Uh, I, I personally like to go to as many hospitals. If someone's in a hospital, I try to go if possible. I can't make it because sometimes I'm in another country or uh, whatever. Uh, but we try to send people. But having people in the congregation do that. Real ministry happens when, when you're, um, uh, you can minister and encourage one another. All right? So you find someone who's going through a hard time. doesn't mean they have to come see the pastor. They have to see you. You know, and pray for one another. Real ministry happens when you can share the gospel with someone and encourage them. Real ministry happens when you can explain the Bible to someone else. All right? And so there's this, uh, that's, that's doing the work of ministry. Real, real ministry happens when you can prophesy, when you can speak a God word over someone else, either in the church or outside of the church, because you've been trained how to hear God's word. 
Uh, and you know God's word because of, you know, teaching and the discipleship tracks and Sunday sermons and Bible studies. So that you're not, you can pull out those scriptures and say, well, I think that this means such and such and have a confidence. Then, then the church can be positioned to multiply and change our community. Uh, and that's, that's God's uh, purpose. Now, I am available as pastor, okay? Um, you may not see me on a Sunday because I may be in Vandalia or maybe ministering in another church somewhere else. But I'm here most weeks, throughout the week, and I do take appointments. And, and a lot of people don't think they can ask for an appointment. If, if the, only, the only catch is you, can, you need to email me because that's how I keep track. <clears throat> and so it's the best way to reach me. And so, like, hey, Pastor, can I sit down and talk? I will try to schedule you that week. I've found it's better to do it quick because if I set it two weeks out, something's going to come up, <laughs> all right? And so I meet with people every week. Uh, it's a regular thing, but I don't do counseling. If you want ongoing counseling, I'll meet with you one time and say, you know, I think you need to talk to Bill and Mary Lee, the head of our healing and restoration team and somebody in the church, or I think you need professional counseling. Um, uh, and I recommend this service. You need to, or I, often it's both. You need a professional counselor, and then you need a healing and restoration team because there are different tool sets. Or here's a book you should read about that. Or if it's just a life change, I, this is really kind of what I, what I do mostly is like, I'm considering these two options. Uh, what, I just want your input. I love those appointments. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, and, uh, you know, if you're just feeling God's leading in a particular way, you can make an appointment with me or one of the other pastors that we have on staff, or other leaders. And so I just want to communicate that, that I am available. And if I'm going to be out of town, I'll say I'm going to be out of town. Uh, but let's do it when I get back. <clears throat> All right? Ultimately, it's for the purpose of equipping you to do the work of ministry. And don't you think it's more exciting to be called to do the work of ministry than to just watch someone else doing it? You know? Timothy was told by Paul to raise up four generations. All right? And this is 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So the first generation was Paul. Things you've learned from me, Timothy. So Paul had his Timothy, but Timothy was told to find faithful men that you can commit these truths who are able to teach others, all right? And so there's four generations of transference, and that was to continue. That's the pattern. And so my question to you is, where are you uh, on this scale, and who is teaching you, okay? So, well, I'm teaching you right now. Maybe you didn't notice. <laughs> all right, but you can have other people. It may be uh, someone you listen to, books you read, Who's teaching you? Who's your, who's your Paul? All right? But then who's your Timothy? Because right? you need the, the best way to learn is to? Teach. Absolutely. It absolutely is. And so, so too many people sat in church for too many years just trying to learn, thinking, I'll, and I don't really understand it well enough. Well, as soon as you try to explain it to someone else, you're forced to understand it better. All right? So you need to be teaching others in order to be in this, in order to be a healthy Christ follower, all right? And you need to be being taught. And so follow me as I follow Christ. Christ was leading, and in order to follow Christ, uh, you have to be a leader, because Jesus was a leader, so you need to lead someone else. And so find someone. Now, that doesn't mean you schedule a time and you meet with them at 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon every week. It may mean that it's someone at work that you're helping to understand the Bible a little better. And whenever you have an opportunity to have lunch with them, you bring up the conversation. It may be your kids. And for a season, that's what you invest much of your time in, is just raising and, and explaining and teaching that next generation. That's okay. But you need to have someone that's looking to you for training. And you need to have someone that you're looking to for training. And that never stops. Right? And so we have the emphasis of a church that's fulfilling the, perp the eternal purpose of God. That church is really important. He's not going to do away with it. 
All right? The church is the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. And so church is very personal to God. That was our first point. The second point was that church needs to look like Jesus' ministry, that there was a core, there was a congregation, there's a crowd. We're ministering to the lost. The church is a place where they can come in and feel comfortable. We're ministering to our congregation. And, uh, so people that are here get edified, trained up, and then we have a core of leaders where are you in that scale and how can you take a step up to the next level of leadership and become more of a core? Um, it's family friendly. How can you help make this church more family friendly? And then releasing, training up, raising up and releasing ministry and not only being trained by people, but training others. So I challenge you to ask yourself, where am I in that? And, um, you know, how can I better uh -huh. get plugged in. You know, if you go through the discipleship track, I think it was announced today that uh, once you go through discipleship track, we want you to teach a discipleship track. You know, it's easy. We got all the materials. Take it and do it in your home. Do it at work. Uh -huh. And that's just an easy way for you to go from being congregation to being, you know, potential core leader. So we try to create as many opportunities as we can for you to take that next step.